These loops are made of very simple computer code, but they do something we thought only biological life could do. They reproduce. They are the basic organisms of artificial life, life that exists inside a computer. And this new form of life is evolving very quickly. Already it is possible to imagine creatures that can not only hunt, eat and protect themselves, but also breed and mutate. Artificial life is the wild card of science, offering new insights into biology and evolution, and perhaps embarking on some evolution of its own. This is the man responsible for the birth of the self-reproducing loops, the man who believes more than anyone in the potential of artificial life. I have responded to constructs that are entirely within the virtual world of a computer um, in ways that uh, are identical to the ways I've responded to, to real life. They have surprised me, caught me unawares, and have uh, sort of uh, uh, contemplated me in, in the same way that, that I've, I've been contemplated by animals, and it's, it's very spooky. For Langton, the spookiness began in the 1970s. While he was working all night in a lab that ran the forerunner of artificial life, called the game of life. I was sitting at my desk uh, in front of the computer going through a, a, a program that I was trying to debug. And in the meantime, I had thrown this game up on, on the computer and was every now and then glancing over and watching the patterns that would develop on the screen. And at one point, I looked over at the screen, watched it for a little while, went back to debugging my code. And I had this, suddenly I had the, this distinct impression that there was something else in the room with me that was alive. At that instant, a fundamental distinction dropped away from me. The distinction between me and what I, the behavior that I was capable of and the machine and the behavior that it was capable of. I saw no reason to assume that uh, just because something was made out of different material, it couldn't exhibit similar behaviors. Langton set out to prove the validity of artificial life, but he ran into trouble because the academic establishment just didn't want to know. His work was neither computer science nor biology, and anyway, the ideas behind artificial life were just too eccentric. Work in artificial life wasn't considered to be respectable in those days, and it really isn't considered to be respectable now either. Um, I think for some time to come, people who do highly interdisciplinary things and highly avant-garde things like that are going to be on the fringe and uh, are going to have a tough time in the mainstream academic establishment. Langton was forced into the academic wilderness and for years he worked completely on his own but he needed a place where he could pull together all the strands of his background in computers, philosophy and biology to create artificial life and he finally found it here in New Mexico at the Santa Fe Institute. Well, the wonderful thing about the Santa Fe Institute is that they've managed to break down the walls that you find in most academic institutions between the various different disciplines. The natural world isn't naturally broken up into biology and economics and physics and chemistry. Um, and many of the problems that we treat really need to be addressed by um, scientists from many different disciplines working together and trying to crack a problem. Langton and his colleagues recreate the behavior of basic forms of life inside computers. They come up with things like this virtual ant, which is instructed to follow very simple rules. A red ant is programmed to turn black squares green and green squares black. Blue ants are instructed to do the opposite. They put a block of the ants on the screen, take their hands off the controls, and then just sit back and watch. The behavior of the ants is unpredictable but sometimes something extraordinary happens. Without being told to, the ants suddenly seem to cooperate with each other and start building regular structures of squares. They are no longer just lines of computer code projected on a screen. Something else has emerged, something not designed by the scientist. This is artificial life. Once you accept the idea that life is a logical, is an, an emergent phenomena of a logical system, then it really doesn't matter whether you're talking about something inside of a computer CPU or whether you're talking about something that exists in a physical, wet and mushy body. The emerging behavior displayed by this artificial life is providing insight into the study of real behavior in the wild. The virtual life forms cooperate in ways that shed light on the complex nature of cooperative behavior of real animals. 
In the study of artificial life, we've, we've sort of come to the realization that nature has solved many of the problems that organisms face in their environments, not by taking individuals and making them more and more and more complex over time, but by finding that collections of individuals with different skills, when they're brought together and function as an ecology, can solve a really wide variety of problems because of the way in which the, the behavior of the collection can be so much more complex than the behavior of the individuals. But the significance of this work goes way beyond its immediate practical application to biology. Langton is no longer alone in being able to guess at the uncharted alien worlds that artificial life may take us to. In, in the traditional view of a computer, um, the, the computer is the ultimate man-made artifact and therefore should be the farthest away from sort of the wild and, and, and diverse uh, and, and uncontrollable uh, nature red in tooth and claw. But the fact is that what we're trying to get across is the point that computers um, have the potential to give rise to artificial worlds which can be just as wild and creative and natural and spontaneous and red in tooth and claw as the nature that we see in the outside world. He predicts the field of artificial life will expand fast. Today it's ants, tomorrow it will be much larger and more sophisticated life forms. There will be self-replicating robots um, probably in my lifetime. Uh, it's, it's an engineering problem, it's not a problem of, uh, uh, it's not a problem of in principle. It's, um, it's just a matter of working out the engineering details. Von Neumann proved that we could have self-replicating machines. Um, there's nothing in principle dif uh, difficult about constructing self-reproducing robots, we just have to um, apply ourselves to the problem. I think it's, it's uh, probable that within, say, 50 years that artificial life forms will achieve consciousness. You can already um, you know, do a back-of-the-envelope calculation about computers, and depending on the numbers you put in you, and, and your estimate of how complicated the, the human brain is, you get estimates like 2025 for the point where the hardware capacity of a computer is uh, likely to equal that of the human brain. Um, the real problem is, of course, programming computers and getting them to have intuition and so that they can learn and, and do things that mimic human beings. But uh, there's a lot of progress being made in that, and I think that uh, that will follow shortly thereafter. Uh, a reporter once asked me how I felt about my, uh, the fact that my descendants would be living in, a, in such a world. And I stopped in mid-answer because all of a sudden I realized that I wasn't sure which descendants he was talking about. Was he talking about my biological descendants or what will be our descendants in the, the uh, replicating, evolving machines that we create? They will be, as Hans Moravec calls them, uh, our, the children of our mind. But can we honestly believe that these life forms will ever be alive in the same way that we are? And if they really are alive, what are the implications of turning off the power? Artificial doesn't mean false or fake or unreal. It will be real life, but it will be real life that has been made by man rather than by nature. So I think that it's, it, the ethical questions are going to be very important. Uh, um, to what extent does something that's alive have rights to its existence and its future evolutionary development um, merely because it's alive, uh, regardless of the specific hardware that it's alive in? I think that there's an awful lot of interesting and important questions to address there. I can just tell you that um, once I had achieved uh, those self-reproducing loops for the very first time, I, I had uh, a, a moment's hesitation when I went to turn the computer off that, that morning.